know how long this water's been here, but I'm going to drink it. <laughs> it's not living water. I'm still here. No. <laughs> well, first of all, um, we want to thank you for coming and coming on site and being with us online. The Lord bless you for your choosing to be with us in worship today. Just wanted to let you know that the, the uh, membership meeting yesterday went really well at night. We had a good attendance. And uh, if, your, if your name is written in the book of life in heaven, there is another role that you should be on, and that's the membership road here. So we invite you to be a member if you're not a member. Put it in prayer and consider it so we as God's people can move forward. We invite you to do just that. This past week, I had the joy of uh, attending our Bible studies and, uh, you know, the German study and the uh, English Bible study, as well as the Friday night men's Bible study. And I want to say that I was really impressed with the leadership and uh, guiding of the study. And uh, the, those who attended contributed really well in terms of good insight. And so sometimes when we are without a pastor, uh, people have to step up to the plate and they have to study the word and they have to share the word. And in between studying and sharing, we got to apply it. We have to apply it. So um, I was just thrilled with uh, the leadership and uh, the teaching. And so we praise God for the men and the women that are in our congregation and in this body of Christ. And we want to thank you for your prayers. If you have the opportunity to come early next Sunday to pray, um, then we encourage you to do so. To let you know, I'm in town in Waterloo on Wednesdays and Thursdays, and so I'll be staying overnight on Wednesday, so I'd like to visit people on Wednesday and Thursday, but I'll be attending the Bible studies as well. So uh, if you would like a visit, I can't read your mind, so if you like a visit, something you want to share, um, it's important for the pastor to get to know their people, like a shepherd gets to know their sheep. So that's very, very important. And, you know, you don't have to have anything major uh, to, to share, but uh, you can just uh, have me over for a cup of coffee. That's appreciated. We want to thank you for those that are new, uh, that are visiting us today. Uh, we don't call you visitors. We call you guests. You are our guest, and we, we are, are thrilled that you have joined us today. And uh, a visitor doesn't come back anymore. They just visit, and then they go. But we, are, we want you to be our guest, and we invite you to come back as, as you have opportunity to do so. We're also thrilled for whoever's online. I know my two sisters listen in from PEI, and there is, you know, Marcus probably listens in, and, uh, and Nick listens in, and I know Kevin. I talked to Kevin uh, LaSalle not too long ago on his birthday, and he said when he has occasion, he, he pops in to see what's going on at, at the home church. So those are great things. So great things. So remember, uh, remember our, our ministry here in our community, and let us shine for God. Wherever you are, you're a light. You're a light, so shine for God and make a difference in, in people's lives, and we thank you for that. Um, let's, uh, let's pray for our people in, uh, in um, our brothers and sisters in Ukraine, and we have a prayer that's going to go up on the screen, and uh, let us pray this together. Again, we are reminded that uh, we need to pray that where, whatever the enemy intends for evil, that our sovereign God will take and change it for the good, okay? And uh, this, is, this is one way of how we can pray for our brothers and sisters. So let's pray together. Our next slide begins. Together. Dear Lord God, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name in all the earth. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We pray for those facing an enemy who rages, both in the evil, the devil who loves to steal, kill, and destroy, and in those pseudo-kings who are the devil's pawns. We believe both will shortly find themselves overthrown by your mighty hand, O Lord, in wonderfully ironic and victory. We pray for those under attack, that you provide for the, all of them. We pray that you will hear every cry for help and be their refuge. We pray for strength and wisdom amid so many needs. We pray that believers will experience your grace sufficient to love 
and serve those around them, giving hope in Christ. We call on you, O God of righteousness, justice, and peace, to come swiftly against the tyrant, terrorizing the people of Ukraine. We pray for you, O Lord, to set free the helpless and oppressed. May you, O Lord, be glorified in humbling the pride of man. Amen. We continue in prayer. I'd like to pray a prayer for us uh, based on Psalm 139. And again, I encourage you to, when you read the Psalms, to make it a personal prayer. And so a prayer based on Psalm 139. Let us pray. Lord God and Father, we enter your presence with thanksgiving and praise. For you are good, you are righteous, you are holy and perfect in all your ways. We praise you, Lord, with all our hearts, and we bow down before your holy temple in the heavenlies. We praise your name for your love and your faithfulness. We praise you for you have exalted above everything, all things in heaven and on earth, everywhere and in all places, your name and your word. When we call upon you, you hear and answer us. It is you who makes us bold and stout-hearted. You make us persistent and consistent to walk in all your ways. May all the kings and earthly rulers praise you. O Lord, when they hear the words from your mouth, may they sing your wondrous works and ways, and your truth and your mercy and your power and your love. We know that you, O Lord, sit on high. You are enthroned on high, and from where you look upon the lowly and the humble in heart, you also see the proud. You give grace to the humble and you resist the proud, and you are aware of all our ways. O Lord God, our Father, there is nothing hidden from your watchful eye. Your compassionate heart and your righteous right hand of justice will accomplish your purpose and will. And although we walk in the midst of troubles, you preserve our lives, and we bring before you especially our brothers and sisters in Ukraine and those in neighboring countries. You see their affliction. You know of their suffering and their, and their pain. You hear their cry for help. You know the injustice. You know the abuse. You know the violence. You know the wickedness that's being carried out. And you feel the despair of those fleeing their beloved land. You know and feel the loss of loved ones who have died, the despair of not knowing what the future holds, and the need for food and shelter and safety and peace and hope. Oh, Lord, we cry to you to take action. We call upon you to be our refuge and our strength. Almighty God, your only sovereign, who turns evil intent into good, be true to your character and your promises. Free the captives, uh, bring relief to the oppressed. Bring hope to the downtrodden, salvation and safety and eternal life to those who seek you in faith. We pray, O Heavenly Father, that you will stretch out your hand against the anger of the foe, that ruthless enemy, the evil one, the devil and his pawns, who blindly do his wicked works of killing and stealing and destroying, of deceiving in attempts to oppose your plan and purpose for us all who dwell on earth. O Lord, fulfill your purposes for us today, here, as well as abroad. Fulfill your purposes for us in our hearts and in our homes, in our families and those in our circle of relatives and friends. Fulfill your purposes and plan for your church, for your body, and for, local, for our local communities. Do not abandon the works of your hands. We are the sheep of your fold and the people under your care. Amen. Amen. Well, today is Communion Sunday, and uh, I always like to uh, spend a little time talking about uh, our salvation. And so today, particularly, our topic is, uh, is uh, three phases of salvation. Now, there's, there's not as many forms, uh, notes going out, but we can make extra forms, uh, notes a little bit later on. Someone said to me, if you don't have a plan, you'll plan to fail. If you don't have a plan, you plan to to fail. So as we prepare ourselves for communion this morning, we realize that God so loves us that he has a plan. His plan of salvation. 
that Jesus died for us, that he was buried, that on the third day he rose again from the dead, and that he will come and take us to be with him. He has a plan. And we can simplify it simply as the gospel, but it is also a complicated plan with many, many words that are associated with salvation. So today I wanted to look at three words that are associated with salvation. The first one is justification, sanctification, and then glorification. So what is God's plan for us? What is God's plan for us? Well, the Bible can be summarized in one sentence, and this is it. There is a perfect God, there is a perfect holy God who brings sinful mankind back to himself. So the whole Bible is we have a holy, perfect God, perfect in every way, and we have sinful man, and we as sinful man cannot come to God. No matter what we do, we are never good enough to approach God and to get to God. We're all lost. We're lost. We have lost the connection. We're walking in darkness. We're blind. And so God needs to raise the standard. God needs to take initiative. So God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. So he took the initiative and he sent one who is a savior. He sends a savior because we need forgiveness of sin. He didn't send an architect because we don't need a fancy house. He didn't send a mechanic because we don't need a car. He didn't send a doctor because we do have ailments and we live in that. He didn't send us a, a financial guy, although we have money. He sent us our greatest need is forgiveness of sins. And we are lost without God. He is the foundation. He is the way that we must live. He is the way to God through Jesus Christ. He is the very truth of God. In a world of deceit and despair and lies and misinformation, the truth stands firm. And so we thank God that he is that truth and he is that very life. The life that God gives us is eternal life. It hasn't got a 30-day guarantee. It is eternal forever. And we cannot lose it. We are secure in him. We may not have the assurance that we're secure, well, that's our perspective, but his, from his perspective, he's, it's a certainty because what he has promised, he can never take back. He has given us eternal life and he can never take it back. He says, you will never perish. And so God's word is firm and true. It is the anchor upon which we build our lives. And so God's perfect plan is to restore mankind to himself. So are you outside of God's family? Are you still walking in darkness? Are you walking on a treadmill of life that doesn't go anywhere, that doesn't have any sense, that has routine but no meaning? Well, then you need to turn to Christ. He is the way, he's the truth, and he's the life. To know him is to have eternal life, is to know and have eternal life. He is the best friend because he's the forever friend. And he can accomplish all that he has promised. He's never failed you. And he's never um, abandoned you, even though you felt abandoned. He has always been there. If you look through your life, you'll see the hand of God all throughout your entire life. Blessing upon blessing upon blessing. For he blesses those who are his, and he blesses those who have not called upon his name just yet for saving grace. And so God restores himself, uh, mankind to himself, and it is through Jesus Christ. He's the mediator. He's the liaison. He is the savior. He is the friend. He's the redeemer. He is the one who paid the price. And so it is by grace. We don't deserve it. It is by grace. We don't deserve it. And it is through faith. You and I have to believe. You have to accept. We have to depend upon him. You see, in Isaiah 53 that was read, it, uh, it clearly states that uh, in verse 7, that Jesus is the sinless lamb, the sacrificial lamb. And it is his plans that uh, will that stand firm, that he is a sacrifice for us. So in verse 7. And so we are sinners because we, uh, we have by birth. Uh, from Adam, we are inherit that sin. It says very clearly in Romans 5, 12, it says, just as sin entered into the world through one man and death through sin, in the same way death came to all men because all have sinned. So sin came into the world through Adam. Sin, sin came into the universe through Satan. But sin came into the world 
through Adam. And he being a human being, we being human being, and are his descendants, we are also born in sin. So we are sinners by birth. We are also sinners by inheritance, um, by inheritance, our own nature. I used to be a school teacher, and you didn't have to teach kids how to be bad. They figured that out themselves. And you and I have a tendency to do bad. Hopefully, when we walk with the Lord now, the tendency isn't there, but the temptations are always there. And so it says in Ephesians 2, uh, verse 1 to 3, it says, As for you, you were dead. Past tense, you were dead in your trespasses and your sins. You were dead. You were spiritually dead. Physically alive, but spiritually dead. Is that an analysis of you today? Are you physically alive, mentally alert, your heart is beating, you're breathing, but you're spiritually dead? Then you don't care what's going to happen after you die, but there's life beyond, beyond the grave. And so we are dead in our trespasses, past tense. So we follow the ways of this world, and we follow the ruler of the kingdom of the air. There are two kinds of children, children of God and children of the devil. And who you obey and who you do his bidding is the one that you belong to. So we're sinners by birth. We're sinners by nature. We're sinners by choice. When we have a choice to do right and to wrong, sometimes we've traced into taking the wrong choice. And there's a positive sin, which we know it's wrong and we do it. And then there's the omission where we know the good thing to do, but we don't do that. And so there are personal choices. And God says in his word in Isaiah, um, Isaiah chapter 64, verse 6 and 7, he says, all our righteousness, all our good works are filthy rags. Have you ever tried to clean something with a filthy rag? <laughs> you put some more dirt on it, don't you? It doesn't work. And so all our goodness, all our righteousness. You might be a good person. You might live according to your conscience, and you might do everything right. But you know what? Spiritually, you're out of tune with God because you don't have the life that's in him. And so you go through the motions. You might be a good person. You might make a lot of good choices. But there's still sin in our hearts and in our lives. And so Titus 2, verses uh, 11 to 14 is a very good verse. And it talks about um, what God has done in the past and what God is doing presently and what God will be doing. And that is in Titus chapter 2, verse 11. It says, for the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared. That's past tense. When did the salvation of God first appear? Titus 2, verses 11. Well, it appeared to all men when Jesus was born in Bethlehem. For unto you this day is born in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And so past tense, the grace of God, the salvation past tense has appeared. And then in verse 12, we have a present tense. The, the grace of God, God teaches us to say no to ungodliness. And teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions. And we are to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. So today. So there is that aspect of salvation, where, which is called sanctification, where we choose and uh, practice what God wants for us. We're uh, living in a world where there's temptations all around. There are things to do that are right. We are not 100% in our experience and practice perfected, but in our status, we are. So our, we have been justified, status, we are perfect and holy before God. But in our practice, we're not. So there's a difference between justification and sanctification. And we need to know the difference, otherwise we can get them confused, and the Christian life doesn't make sense. So we have a past tense, the grace of God appeared, we have a present tense, we are to live uh, godly, controlled, upright lives. And in verse 13, we are to wait for the blessed hope. That's future. It's coming. Jesus is coming back. Are you ready for him? Are you ready for him? I was visiting uh, an elderly lady, and she was sharing one of the highlights of her life when she was a small girl. And she said the family uh, was without dad all week long because dad was a traveling salesman. 
but we know that he would leave on Monday and we would know that he would come on Friday. And mom got the house nice and clean and made a nice beautiful dinner and there were candles and we all got baths and showered and we all got dressed and we couldn't wait for dad to come home because he always brought a little present. <laughs> there was a reward, there was an anticipation. Let me ask you, Jesus is coming back. That's a reality, that's a truth. Are you ready? Are you excited? I hear some people say, well, I hope he comes sooner than later because I've had enough of this world. Then that's good too. That's good too. But you know, as the time is short, and it is short, are you doing the work for the Lord? Are you living for him in the current day? And so that's a challenge, isn't it? And so there is a Savior, a glorious appearing of our great God and our Savior. And who is this great God and our Savior? It is Jesus Christ who gave himself for us to what? To redeem us. We'll look at redemption another day, but redeeming means to buy back. It's to buy back. Talks about a slave being bought out of the market, the slave market, and being set free to serve a new master, and that is what God has done for us. So the three views, uh, phases of salvation, we have, first of all, we have the past tense, we have been saved. And the theological term, theological, means a theo, it has to do with God. Logical, a logos, is the word. So this is a theological word. And it is in the Bible, and it, we are justified. Justification. What does justification mean? It means we have been declared right before God. That is our status. That is our position. That's a done deal. And when we come to the Lord's table, we know Jesus died for us. This is his body. This is his blood. This is the new covenant in his blood. And so we do this in remembrance. Why remember? Because it happened. It happened a long time ago, but it happened for you and me. So there's a theological term, justification. Present tense, we are being saved. Okay, we are being trained and God, through the Holy Spirit living inside of us, we don't, we don't just have a conscience, we also have the dwelling of the Holy Spirit. So no matter what a non-believer tries to do, all the good amount to nothingness because they only function what their soul and their mind and their passions and their flesh and their conscience tells them. They don't have the Holy Spirit that gives them insight. So when they read the Word of God, it's just literature. It's a book. It's an interesting book, but it doesn't come alive because the author who wrote inspired every word and the author who inspired every writer is not indwelled in the believer, in the person. So the, the natural person doesn't understand the things of God. And so we are being saved. There's a battle going on, and although we try to live our lives for Christ, we have this constant pull from the world. And you know it, the pull from the world system, me first me first. Get all that you can. Drink, eat, and be merry, for tomorrow we shall die. Okay? That's the system of the world. But there's also the flesh, the passions within us that want the things of the world. And, of course, the devil. The devil. And so we are being pulled always to away from the things of God. And that's why it's important for us to gather together to worship God, to read his scripture, and to study his word. So future tense, we will be saved. And that is, the theological term is glorification. Okay, we will get a glorified body. So let's look at them briefly, very quickly. Um, justification means being declared right before God. It is past tense. We have been saved. Okay, the penalty of sin has been paid. So now there's no condemnation to us. We are now have peace with God. The provision for the penalty of sin, see the wages of sin is death. So Christ died for us. And when did this happen? When did this justification happen? Did it happen over a long time frame or did it happen instantaneously? It happened instantaneously when Jesus said, it is done. It's finished. When you and I said, yes, Lord, I'm yours. As soon as you accepted Christ as personal Lord and Savior, the provision was Christ's death and his resurrection. It was imputed upon you. All our sins was imputed, credited, 
to Jesus, all his righteousness was credited to us that happened instantaneously. 2 Corinthians 5, um, 17. Um, our righteousness, you know, he became sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God. It's not something we earn, something we're given, his righteousness. And so how do we respond to that? Well, Andrew read it earlier. It said, it is by faith we've been justified. It is by grace through faith that you have been saved. It is not of yourselves. It has nothing to do with us. It is accepting a gift. And some people say, well, I'm not good enough to go to heaven. Amen. Well, nor am I. But it is a gift. And when you get that gift, you receive it. And you say, thank you. But then you don't put it in the back. You open it up and apply it to your lives. And so make it personal. Being justified is having peace with God. There's no condemnation. We have been justified through faith and we have peace with God. Romans 5.1 and Romans 8.1. And so we have been gifted eternal life. Do you have that gift? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. If you have Jesus, you have life. Spiritual life. Eternal life. So in a sense, there is a have-nots and the haves. Which group are you in? Which group are you in? John 16, John 3.16 says, let's say it together. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. The message is that the Father loves us, sent Jesus to be the Savior of the world. That's the message, that he died for our sins. Okay? What's our response? Believe. 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 Nothing you have to do. You don't have to come to the front. You know, you don't have to sell every, every stuff you have. You have to come. You have to believe. Believe that Jesus is who he says he is, that he is God, and that you confess with your mouth that he is in God and believe in your heart. Romans 10, 9. And so have you received that gift? So there is a message that we can share. So you, you and I can share and witness to, to other people just using John 3.16. What is the message? God sent his son, Jesus, to be the savior of the world. What is our response? Is to believe. What is the offer? Eternal life. Do you have eternal life? You can. It is a gift. It doesn't cost you anything, but cost God everything. So the second phase is sanctification. Sanctification is being set apart for God. This is in the present tense. If justification is in the past tense where we got eternal life, sanctification is the present tense. It talks about the, spirit, the Christian life. And we have our ups and downs in the Christian life. It is our practice. If the position was justified, no condemnation, then our practice is struggling and fighting with all these temptations. What we want to do, we don't do, and what we don't want to do, we do. And so that's natural, that's natural. And, uh, and what is the time frame for that? Well, justification was a one-time moment thing. Sanctification, the process of becoming more like Jesus is ongoing. So what you feed your soul is what's gonna grow. So if you have a Bible and it's getting uh, dust on the shelf, then it's not feeding your hungry soul, and you're going to be malnutritioned as a believer. And you're not going to be strong. And so what is God's provision over this, this, uh, this power over sin, the victory over sin? The provision is the Holy Spirit inside of us. Jesus justified us by dying on the cross. The Holy Spirit sanctifies us because he lives inside of us. It's the work of the Holy Spirit. Our response is to be faithful. Our response is to be faithful. In Romans 6, 6 and 7, it says that our flesh, our old nature, was crucified when Jesus died. That we died in him, and now we live through him. He lives through us. So anyone who has crucified the flesh has died to sin. We have been freed from sin's power, and we can live for God. I love the illustration of going to a farmer's fence out in the field, an electric fence, and hanging on to the wire, right? And you can hang on to that wire. There's a lot of power going through that, 
but you can hang on to that when you're in rubber boots because you're insulated. So the devil can do all he wants in your life, but if you're in Christ, you're untouchable. Right? But if you don't want to be in Christ, you don't want to lean on him, you just want to go barefoot into this, you know, dewy, grassy area, pasture, and hang on to the wire, you'll get shocked. It serves you right. And so walk by the Spirit, and we will not fulfill the lust of the, the flesh. You know it. We know it, but we have to live it through. We need to submit ourselves to God. The application, how do we make it personally? Well, we have to accept Christ. If you haven't done so, let him justify you in his grace. And we need to submit ourselves to him. And we need to resist the devil. It says in James 4, 7 that we should resist the devil. Now, if God tells you to resist the devil, then it's possible. Right? You say, I got this addiction. I can't get out of it. No, you can. You can I knew a man who told me uh, he accepted Christ by watching online, and he gave his heart to the Lord Jesus Christ. And he said for years and years he had a problem with alcohol. He tried every single therapy to get off alcohol, and none of it worked. But as soon as he accepted the Lord, the Lord took away his taste for alcohol. He never touched a drop after that. So I said, that's evidence the Holy Spirit is inside of you, that he's done a good work. And so there's no power greater than the power that is within us. In 1 John 4, 4, it says, Greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. You have the Holy Spirit living inside of you. Are you tapping on that power? We all have cars out there, right? Anybody go out there and push his car home? <laughs> no, you don't. You don't rely on your power to push the car home. You sit in it and rely on the power that's within so why don't you and I live according to the power of God that he has indwelled us with? You know, let's live for him. We don't have to be a big church. We have to be a healthy church. How do we become a healthy church? Each individual is healthy. How do you have a healthy body? Each cell is healthy. How do we have a healthy church? Each member is healthy. And so now we go to, uh, to glorification. What does glorification mean? Glorification is when the believer enters into eternity to be with God forever. Glorification means glory. We're in him. Glorification. And when does that happen? It's when we die. When does that happen? Okay. Um, to be absent from our body is to be present with God. The believer, as soon as he dies, the body gets laid to rest, but the spirit and soul goes immediately to be with him. That's glorification. But if he comes before we die, then we're translated and we're given immediately a glorified body and the dead in Christ shall rise, but given a glorified body. So this phase called glorification is a future thing. We will be saved. It'll be a process of salvation past, salvation present, ongoing, salvation future yet to come. And so when we do communion, what do we say? It says very clearly that um, it says very clearly that uh, we need to remember that he died for us and we need to uh, examine ourselves. We need to look inside of us. Um, remember that he's died for us and then it says, for whenever we eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death. We're proclaiming the Lord's death. When we participate, we're saying, yes, you have died for me and I, you want, I want you to live through me. I have life because you have resurrected from the grave. I have been forgiven. I am your child. I belong to you. Just like the little bread of morsel belongs to the loaf, each member belongs to the Christ. And so whenever you drink of it, whoever drinks this bread and drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner, it's the manner that's unworthy, not the person. Okay? It's an unworthy manner. An unworthy manner means two things. You don't understand what it means. You don't understand the bread is Christ and you belong to him. You don't understand that. And you don't understand that the symbol of the blood was shed for you, that you have been cleansed and refined and you are to live a pure and holy life. You don't understand that. So then you take that in an unworthy manner. Or you have sin in your life and you're dirty. I remember when mom called everybody to the dinner table. Okay, everybody come to the dinner table. And first thing is we need to show our hands. And when the hands were dirty, then you, didn't, you have to go and clean up. 
So when you come to the communion table and your hands are dirty, leave your gift on the altar, go back and reconcile. Because if we don't do that, it says here that we, we are guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so therefore a man and a woman ought to examine himself. Notice it says examine himself or herself. We're not supposed to say, hey you, hey you, hey you. No, no. Between you and God. The word is a mirror to your heart and allow the spirit of God to speak to you. And then so that's the present tense of sanctification. That's why we come on a regular basis. It's like you go to the doctor for a physical checkup. You come to the memorial service. You come to uh, Last Supper. You come to this Holy Eucharist, whatever you want to call it. It's a spiritual checkup. How's it going with God and you? How's it God going with God and me? I want to be a clean vessel so God can use me. If you have two glasses sitting on the kitchen counter, one is dirty, one is clean, I know which one you're going to grab to use. And the Lord Jesus does the same. He wants to use a clean vessel. You belong to him, even though you're a dirty vessel, you belong to him, but he wants to use you to be fruitful. And so um, Philippians 3.20, when we talk about glorification, Philippians 3.20 says that our citizenship is in Canada, right? No, our citizenship is in heaven. You're an ambassador, you're in a foreign land, and you are his representative. And so our citizenship is in heaven, and guess what? That's where God will come in order to take us home. And our earthly bodies in Philippians 3.21 will be changed to a glorified body. And when is it going to happen? Is it going to happen over a long time? No, in a twinkling of an eye, it's going to happen. 1 Corinthians 15. I'm rushing through this, I know, but you can get the notes later on. <laughs> you can even buy the video. No, you can get online and watch it again. How's that? That'll be a double blessing if you watch it again. Wouldn't that be? Because God's word will not come back empty. And so the provision for this glorification, well, God gives us a glorified body. And we're going to be removed from this world of sin. So justification, the penalty has been paid. These are three words begin with the letter P. The penalty has been paid. In sanctification, there's power over the power of sin. Victory over the power of sin. And in glorifications, we're taken out of the presence of sin. It's like Star Trek. Scotty, beam me out of here. I'm gone. And what a wonderful day that will be when we meet him face to face. And so this is the promise of God. John 15, uh, 14, 1 to 6. Jesus said, I uh, trust in God, trust also in me. Are you trusting him? Have you trusted him in the past tense? to forgive you of all your sins? Are you trusting him in the struggles you're going through today? Are you trusting the promise that he's coming back again? Because he said, I've gone to prepare a place for you. You know, when we have a big meal, we leave an empty space for a member of our family who is still on the way. But when they come, we're all complete. There's an anticipation that there is come and there's a place. And so we thank God, he's prepared a place for us. He has reserved a place for us. And he himself will come. He's not going to send a chauffeur. He's not going to send anybody else. He's going to come himself. What a hot date, eh? Wouldn't that be cool? He's going to come. He's going to come for you and I. And the whole world will see him. What a glorious day that will be. So there's a future is bright. The future is bright, okay? And he will keep his promises. And so we thank God for that. I'd like to leave with you a couple of things. And first of all is James 1.12. Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial. What is our responsibility? Faithfulness. Faithfulness. Okay? Persevere under trial because when he or she has stood the test, we're being tested. When we're looking at the life of Abraham in Genesis, he's going test after test after test after test. Have you, are you failing the test or are you, are you winning? Are you passing the test? And so he will receive a crown of life. That's right. You're going to get a crown of life which means you made it to the finish line. And what are you going to do with that crown? Give it into your trophy case? No, we don't have a trophy case. God is our trophy. He's our shield and our great reward. We're going to take that crown and we're going to put it on, the, um, on his feet and we're going to praise him. What kind of a crown is it? It's not a diadem. It's not a kingly crown. It's a Stephanos. It's a, a champion, an athletic crown. Like in the Olympics, you know, years ago they had this wreath of oral wreath of leaves and 
You're a winner. You're a champion. You made it. And so that's the kind of crown we're going to get, okay, even though we're going to rule with him. And so um, we thank God for that. What is our response? Well, let's make it really personal. Justification. Have you accepted Christ? Have you accepted? Have you believed? Have you received eternal life? That's a one-time thing. Sanctification, is he working on you? Are you cooperating? Are you with the program that he has for you? Or are you resisting? Are you resisting? Yes, I'm a member of the team, but I'm going to do my own thing. No, you can't do that. If you have one little, one musician in an orchestra that plays the wrong tune, those who have ears to hear will be able to hear that. Let's sing together. Let's be in harmony. Let's be united and allow him to work in and through us. Glorification, well, we do this in remembrance of him, in remembrance of his death, until he returns, until he comes again. So whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Is he coming? Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father God in heaven, we thank you and realize that your plans is a total victory over the penalty of sin, of the power of sin, and over the presence of sin. And that we thank you that you've justified us in Jesus Christ, that you're in the process of sanctifying us, that in our practice we become more like Jesus every day. Help us to be cooperative. Help us to be abiding in you. Help us to submit ourselves to you. And help us to eagerly, with our heads up, and with anticipation and great joy, look forward to that great return of our God and glorious uh, Savior, Jesus Christ. So we thank you, O oh God, that you have a plan, that you never fail, and that you do it all, and you do it really well. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. We will now sing our song as we go into communion, 268. 268. Please stand as we sing this song, 268. After supper, the Lord uh, took the bread and uh, he gave thanks and he broke it and he said do this as often as you do in remembrance of me so let us take the bread together heavenly father we thank you that you're the bread of life we thank you, Father, that you gave Jesus, and he's the bread of life. He's the manna from heaven. He's the living bread. And without him, we, we have no life. We have temporary life. We have earthly life. But uh, what a glorious thing to experience spiritual life and eternal life, abundant life in you. So we thank you that Jesus died for our sins and that he was buried. But that he rose again, that we might have new life. We thank you for this blood that was shed. And as we partake of this of this cup, we remember that Jesus gave it all. It wasn't half-hearted. It wasn't a portion. It was one and all. And so we thank you, God, that the Lord Jesus Christ voluntarily put himself on the cross to be the full payment, the atonement, the propitiation for our sins. Not only for our sins, but the sins of the whole wide world, everybody, past, present, and future to come. We thank you what a great God we are, and we, we, we take this cup in remembrance and with thanksgiving and praise in our hearts. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Let's take this together. See the emptiness of the cup and uh, give, your, give yourself, all of yourself to God. He gave all of himself to us. What other choice do we have? And so let us dismiss in prayer. Heavenly Father, we praise you for your, your love that was shown and demonstrated in Jesus Christ coming to die for us. He left the glories of heaven in order to come and live among us. He left the glories of heaven, the majestic God, took on a human, limited, restrictive body, all because of love, all because he wanted to identify himself with us, all because he wanted to reveal himself to us, that we might know the Father, and that we might have life eternal. We thank you, O Lord, for this indescribable gift of eternal life, and we pray that you go before us in the days to come. Help us shine for you, and help us to put into practice what we've learned. Not to be hearers only, but doers of your word. 
Go before us this week, bless each one. Give health and strength in body, soul, and spirit. And may we be an influence of light and salt to our family, to our relatives, to those we are acquainted with, to our neighbors, to those that we have contact with, and to those who spontaneously you bring into our lives. The Lord bless you and keep you. God make his face to shine upon you and God be gracious unto you now and forevermore. Until we meet again, go in his peace. Amen.